kind of a long name. It's called the American Society for the Defense of Tradition, Family, and Property, or TFP for short. And just in a very small nutshell, we're an organization that fights against the court cultural errors of our days, uh, be it abortion, same-sex marriage, uh, the breakdown of the family, all of these things that are causing us so much grief in society today. With that said, um, I want to get right into our talk, if we could. And the talk tonight, as you all know, is going to be about St. Damien. And I have to begin by saying I feel a little uh, uneasy addressing uh, an audience of Hawaiians about St. Damien. Because who am I to come in here and tell you about your patron saint? But it, it is an, uh, he is uh, a subject matter that I've studied quite a bit in the three years that I've been coming here. And while I'm sure you all know his story, at least uh, the basic uh, parts of his story, hopefully there'll be some things that you haven't heard, and hopefully I'll at least be able to shine a light on a different aspect of St. Damien's life. And with that said, uh, I plan today to focus on two aspects of St. Damien's life. Two aspects, one of which you're all very familiar with, the other of which I don't think many people are very familiar with. The first aspect is the aspect of suffering. St. Damien was a man who accepted his suffering entirely. He accepted his cross to the very end. And in such, he was a perfect imitation of our Lord Jesus Christ. As has been said many times, we all are followers of a crucified master. And if we're going to follow our master to the end, we have to expect to accept our cross as well. So that's the first thing that I think most people are very uh, well acquainted with the life of St. Damien. He was a man of suffering, a man of sorrows, a man willing to carry the cross of Christ. The other not so well known part of his life that I hope to highlight here is the tremendous persecution that St. Damien suffered, especially from his religious superiors. The bishop and the head uh, in Hawaii, Father Fusnel, who was the head of the Sacred Hearts Father, both persecuted him tremendously. Now these are two things that I think are very helpful for us to understand, especially today. Uh, because one thing about our society today is that they shun every type of suffering. Everything's supposed to be as comfortable as possible, as easy as possible. Nobody wants to put out effort for anything. Uh, look at TV infomercials. You've got a machine that will do everything for you. All you have to do is sit in the chair all day, it'll vacuum the floor for you, it'll brush your teeth for you, and everything else. The other aspect is that in our society, um, we can expect, if we really try to make a difference in society, we can expect to receive some resistance from those who are above us. And I'm not talking only religious superiors, but from the, the basic trend of society, those who hold all the strings of society are not going to like it if we start promoting goodness in society. So I think St. Damien's life is a model for us for both, and as much as it, it's hard for us to accept this, it is true that because of the crisis in the church, many times many of us will have to suffer much more mild but persecution from our religious superiors as well. Not always, but in some cases. So with that said, let's get into the life of St. Damien a little bit. Uh, St. Damien was born in 1840. He was born in Tremelou, uh, Belgium and he was the son of very well-to-do farmers. Now, he was one of seven children, and it's very obvious that he, was, he came from a very pious family because out of those seven children, four of them went into the religious life. He had two sisters, both of whom joined convents, and he had a brother who also was a Sacred Heart father. So out of seven children, four of them joined, uh, entered into the religious life. So he started school in 1847 when he was seven years old, and after six years he quit work to work on his father's farm. Now at this time, St. Damien, whose name was Joseph at the time, was already an extremely powerful and strong young man, gifted with a very, very sharp intelligence, and just full of stamina and strength. At 13 years old, reports say that he would throw around 220 pound bags of grain like they were pillows, 13 years old. He was also capable enough to manage an entire farm on his own. His father would leave and put him in charge of everything, so much so that at 13 his father was thinking 
of investing in a whole other farm and give the direction of it to St. Daniel. Now, as you can imagine, the father, like I said, he was a well-to-do farmer. He was a grain farmer. He grew wheat and, and grains. He had great hopes for St. Damien, that he would follow in his footsteps, that he would become a great, great farmer, he would uh, further the family business. But St. Damien didn't feel fulfilled. He felt the lack of intellectual stimulation. So he started asking his parents if he could go back to school. Now his father, at this point, still was hoping that St. Damien would take over in his line of work. So he sent him to school with the idea that he would be very effective in trading grain be more on the management side of, of bringing grain to market, figuring out all the prices and all those types of things. Well, while uh, St. Damien, Joseph, was back at school, he started to feel the calling to religious life, and it started to pull him very, very strongly. And he broke the news to his parents that he wasn't planning on following up with their business. And as you can imagine, this was a great blow to the family. It was very difficult for his parents to accept that, especially his father, who had such good plans uh, for, for Joseph. Um, but as they were very, very much of a uh, pious family, as I mentioned, they gave their approval, and St. Damien was slated to go to the religion, religious life. One thing that's very interesting, it's kind of curious how these things happen, but St. Damien originally decided he wanted to be a Trappist monk. The Trappists are an extremely contemplative order. They're not ones that go out and do action, that, that are missionaries. They're very contemplative. Now, Damien's brother, Father Pamphile, was already a Sacred Heart's father. And he convinced St. Damien not to become a Trappist because he said, if you're a Trappist, you're not going to do any action. You're just going to sit around and, and read and contemplate all the time. So he convinced St. Damien not to become a recollected soul, but to become a man of action, and Father Pamphile ended up becoming a recollected soul, because he ended up studying, he never made it to the missions, he ended up teaching at the university. So it's funny how their paths kind of cross. Providence has a way of mixing things up every once in a while, and that's very much the way it was with that. So the Joseph, later Father Damien, joined the Sacred Hearts Fathers, and the order is a very beautiful order, and it has a long name. The name of the order, the full name, is the Congregation of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary and the Perpetual Adoration of the Most Blessed Sacrament of the Altar. And this is a very historic order because it was founded in France in order to make reparation for the sins of the French Revolution. Obviously, we know that the French Revolution was a terrible revolution. Um, thousands of nobles, thousands of Catholics, religious, were slaughtered during this time. The mother house of the Congregation of the Sacred Hearts in France is on the road called Picpus, Picpou in French. And that road, right next to the mother house of the Sacred Hearts uh, order, their mother house, right next door is a cemetery that has 1,300 victims, mutilated victims of the French Revolution buried in it. So it was very much an order that was given to reparation. And the reparation consisted primarily in devotion to the Blessed Sacrament, adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, uh, missionary activity and education. They're very active. Their adoration of the Blessed Sacrament is very beautiful. From the very beginning of the, the founding of the Mother House, they started perpetual adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, and they haven't stopped since. It's been perpetual without any hour being miss missing. Adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. So, in 1859, Damien entered the Sacred Hearts Congregation at Louvain as a postulant. And it's very curious because he took the name Damien in honor of two saints from the 200s, early saints. Uh, one, of, one of the two saints, they were a pair, they were actually brothers, it was Saints Damien and Cosmos. And Saints Damien and Cosmos were physician saints. They were early physicians. They're one of the patron saints. They're two of the patron saints of physicians. And St. Damien had no way of knowing at that time that he would end up caring for the sick as much as he did. So it's another kind of providential way. There's kind of a foreshadowing of what's to come. So he took the name 
of Dania, and he did very well in religious life. And in religious life, he really started to his toughness, his stamina, his um, incredible drive really starts to show itself. Uh, part of the order, like I said, is dedicated to perpetual adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. It's in their rule that they have to spend a half an hour a day in adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, and once a week, they have to break up their sleep and do an hour of adoration in the middle of the night. It's actually beautiful because St. Damien kept that custom in all of his missionary journeys. He had a tremendous devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. But Damien, in his early postulancy, very, very commonly would take the hour from 2 to 3 a.m. and not go back to sleep afterwards. So he was extremely robust, very tough. Um, it was very common. He shared a, a room with his brother, Father Pamphile. And Father Pamphile said it was very common for him to wake up in the middle of, middle of the night and look over and Damien's bed would be empty. And he'd look on the floor and St. Damien would be sleeping on the floor just to uh, encourage that toughness that he had. Well, when when uh, St. Damien entered religious life, he really wanted to become a priest. But as we mentioned, he spent a lot of time working on his father's farm, so he was way behind in his education. He didn't even speak Latin yet. So the superiors, his superiors, decided that it was foolish for him to try to catch up in his studies and, be, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and become a priest and decided to make him a choir brother. Step. The choir brothers are a lesser level of the order that sing the office and, and do things, but they don't end up becoming priests. And above all, they don't become missionaries. So St. Damien was kind of uh, distraught by this, but he accepted it. Now, the novitiate of a religious order is very, very difficult. Very, very difficult. But St. Damien was, had so much energy, he decided to further his studies in his spare time. And within a couple of months, he learned Latin fluently and advanced his studies in philosophy and theology so much that his superiors looked at that and they said, no, it's very, very possible he can make it to be a priest. So they put him back on track to the priesthood. Now this uh, is something that's very interesting and that's kind of a constant in St. Damien's life was this incredible drive he had, the incredible toughness, the incredible strength that he had. We're going to see that uh, again and again throughout his life. Well, in October of 1863, his brother, Father Pamphile, was slated to join uh, the missionaries of his order, the Sacred Hearts that were coming to the Hawaiian Islands. He had been chosen. He wanted to be a missionary. Um, all of the missions uh, in this area of the Pacific were actually given to the Sacred Hearts Fathers. They worked on, on a lot of the different uh, missions here, even Samoa. Um, so. Father Pamphile, Damien's brother, is slated to go, and he got typhus fever, which he recovered from, but the doctor quarantined him for six weeks, and the boat was leaving in the, uh, in the midst of that six weeks, so he couldn't go. So that, uh, at that point, St. Damien got a, what was really a crazy idea in his head, that he was going to take his brother's place. Why was that crazy? That was crazy, first of all, because... You know, there was a certain order. You had to wait till you advanced a certain point. You learned how to, how to do apostolate, be a missionary, before you were sent out into missionary territory. And second of all, he hadn't even been ordained a priest yet. There were no seminaries here in Hawaii at the time. So St. Damien knew it was kind of a crazy idea. He knew that his superior wasn't going to agree with it. So he wrote a letter to a superior above his superior. I don't know if you understand, there's very, uh, inside religious orders, it's very um, very hierarchical. You have higher superiors that take care of lower ones and lower ones. So he went straight to the top and wrote a letter to a very high-ranking superior of the order and got permission to go on his place. And he didn't even tell his superior of his monastery what he had done. So all of a sudden, out of the blue, his superior gets a letter in the mail from his superiors, ordering him to send St. Damien to Hawaii. His superior was furious. He was so mad, he came into the refactory where he was eating, and he threw the letter down in front of St. Damien, and he said, you're a fool, but you're going to Hawaii. And everybody stood up and started applauding. And that was how St. Damien um, was able to start his missionary activities. At this point, I'm going to put a slide up. 
All of these pictures I'm sure you're very, very familiar with already. Uh, the first picture that you're going to see is a picture that St. Damien had taken for his family right before he left to go to Hawaii. And um, that was very commonly done because St. Damien knew going to Hawaii he would never see his family again. Never again. He was going far, far on the other side of the world. It's interesting to note that in those days to make a trip, like a boat trip from Europe to the Hawaiian Islands was more dangerous than it is today to go to the moon. Literally. It was more dangerous. It was a very incredible journey. The journey took them four and a half months by boat. Four and a half months. A question of just a couple years prior to this, the, um, it's not working. There it is. Did you send me that? Just a few years prior to this, uh, St. Damien's trip, there was a whole boatload of Sacred Heart Fathers. Twelve or fourteen of them, I don't remember. It was fathers and, and nuns also that sank on their way to the Hawaiian Islands and they all perished. So it was very common for them to have a picture taken of them before they traveled so that the family would have a remembrance of him. This is the picture that St. Damien had taken. And what I want to mention that's very interesting about this is you see his, the way he's holding the crucifix and his posture. When St. Damien uh, entered the order, he became very, very enthusiastic about the missions. He wanted to become a, a missionary. So he took as one of his patron saints, St. Francis Xavier, who was the great Jesuit missionary that always wanted to conquer China. He went through India. He went to Japan, spreading the gospel. And St. Francis Xavier died on an island off the shores of, of China, looking at China. That was his dream, was to conquer China. It's actually very beautiful. While he was dying, he told the people, put my sick bed such that I die looking at China. That's how much he wanted to convert. So St. Francis Xavier was a great missionary. And St. Damien had a picture of St. Francis Xavier in his cell. And he used to pray every, every evening to that picture, asking that he could become a missionary. This posture that St. Damien is, is portraying here is the exact posture that St. Francis Xavier is taking in that picture. If you go to the next slide, this is St. Francis Xavier. I don't think this is the exact uh, picture that St. Damien had, but you see the crucifix. It's, it's the way he's normally portrayed. And so he wanted very much to portray that to his family. I'm a missionary now, and I'm going to follow in the footsteps of St. Francis Xavier. You can go to the next slide. Uh, this one is actually kind of out of place. This is St. Damien eight years later, right before he went to the uh, mission in Molokai. So we can keep it here for just a second. Um, as I said, <clears throat> it took four and a half months by boat for St. Damien and the other missionaries to reach the Hawaiian Islands. And it was a very turbulent, turbulent trip. Uh, it was so bad, the leader of their, their group, the leader of the Sacred Hearts Fathers that was going, couldn't hold food down for the first month of the journey. He couldn't hold any food down for a month. Uh, so it was a very difficult journey, and St. Damien didn't have much trouble with sick, uh, seasickness, so he actually did most of the chores for the whole group while they were going, because a lot of them had difficulty with it. And very beautifully, when they reached the part of the ocean that that other ship carrying the other missionaries had sunk, they were able to sing the office of the dead for them. So it was very, very uh, beautiful. It's funny because you see very much also St. Damien's apostolic zeal, his missionary drive, because all of the crew of the ship were German Lutherans that were taking them. And he spent the whole time trying to convert these German Lutherans to Catholicism. And he was totally unsuccessful. Totally unsuccessful. But he was so on fire, he had to try to do anything he could. So St. Damien arrived in Honolulu on March 19, 1864. And when he arrived, the bishop was furious with him. Because he said, I don't have a seminary. Why are you sending me lay bro uh, brothers? I need priests. I need people to, to send out. So he rushed St. Damien through the rest of his studies. And St. Damien was ordained a priest in the cathedral in Honolulu, Our Lady of Peace Cathedral. It was very interesting um, 
how that whole thing worked uh, because that spot, I don't know, probably many of you know this already, but that spot where the Cathedral of Our Lady of Peace is today was the first piece of land granted to Catholic missionaries in the Hawaiian Islands when it was just a very small thing. It obviously was already in its present condition when St. Damien was ordained there. So shortly thereafter, um, it was only um, about three months they gave St. Damien to finish his studies. He finished, he, he was ordained, and he was initially sent to the Big Island. Uh, if we go to the next slide, this slideshow was more prepared for people who were, were not familiar with Hawaii. You know the Big Island is about, all the other islands fit in about three-fourths of the, the Big Island. It's massive. Massive island. Uh, the Hawaiian Islands are a little bit smaller than Maryland and a little bit larger than Massachusetts. So it's a huge tract of land. If you go to the next slide. St. Damien was sent to the Big Island with one other priest, Father Clement. And Father Clement had a lot more experience than Damien, Damien did, but he wasn't as physically robust as St. Damien was. Uh, nevertheless, St. Damien was given this area, Puna. That was his first diocese, uh, his first, I'm sorry, missionary plot. It was not a diocese, uh, of course. Father Clement was given Kohala Hamakua, so he had this whole section. It's about a fourth of the big island that he was supposed to take care of. After eight months of this situation, Father Clement couldn't hack it anymore. He couldn't take it. It was too hard. It was too difficult for him to travel that whole region. So St. Damien offered to switch with him because he was, was very tough. It used to take St. Damien two weeks to travel and visit all the Catholics in Puna. When he moved to Kohala Hamakua, it used to take him six weeks just to make one rotation and visit all the, the, the Catholics there. And like I said, St. Damien was totally green when he went to the missions, but I think that it shows very clearly that he took to the missionary activities very well because he was a man who was very attached to his family. It was very difficult for him to leave his family. But he said after eight months of ministering to the Catholics in Puna, he said it was harder for him to leave his parishioners than it had been to leave his family. So he had that missionary love, that zeal for souls. He was very attached to his people, very much. So St. Damien moved to Kohala Hamakua, and he really started uh, flourishing as a missionary during this time. Um, it took him six weeks to, to visit all his parishes, like I said. And during the eight years he was there, he did not have a stable location where he lived. Another priest was visiting him once, and he said, Where is your house? Where do you live, Damien? And St. Damien pointed to the saddle of his horse, and he said, That's my house. That's where I live. Because pretty much that's all he did. He was constantly traveling, constantly going. And once again, his strength really showed through. Um, he was very, uh, there was, at that time there was a lot of animosity between the Protestant missions and the Catholic missions. And when he was here, he prided himself because there was a huge vertical cliff and it used to take the Protestant missionaries two hours to climb it and he could climb it in 45 minutes. So that was something that he really prided himself on. Very robust individual. Now, during this time, St. Damien really started to gain the respect of the Hawaiians. He was a, a, a very uh, talented carpenter, and he used to build churches everywhere he went. When he was in that diocese, he built six churches in the eight years that he was there. One of them in a place that was totally inaccessible. He had to climb through the mountains. They couldn't even deliver supplies. He had to drag lumber out of the jungle and, and whatnot. And many, many times, St. Damien by himself would drag logs out of the woods that teams of the Hawaiians couldn't get out. He dragged them out by himself. So he gained a lot of the respect of the people because he was, was so strong and, and so dedicated to what he was doing. Well, at this point, uh, we need to talk a little bit about something that obviously impacted St. Damien's life tremendously, which was the coming of leprosy to the islands in Hawaii. Uh, the first case of leprosy that was positively identified was in 1840. Hawaiian Islands, it's very possible that there were many cases before that. Um, but when the disease arrived here, 
It's, it's not entirely certain where it came from, but it seems most likely that it came from immigrants from China brought leprosy here, and it spread like wildfire here. Uh, actual statistics are hard to come by, but the statistics are usually between 10 and 15 percent of the whole population was infected with leprosy. So it was a, a very, very serious problem, and it was something that needed to be taken care of. There needed to be a quarantine. They needed to stop the spread of the disease. Now this was a very terrible thing, quarantining people, um, separating them from their families. Uh, it, it, was, it was a horrible thing. And what made it all worse was the native Hawaiians saw it very much as a Haole disease, which in, in fact it kind of was. I mean, it was not native here, but they didn't trust the European medicine, which talked about quarantine and whatnot. They had witch doctors they would go to who were, were complete charlatans. They would go, they would pray over them, they'd make a potion, and they'd say, you're fine now. Go out and continue to spread through the population. So the Hawaiians were mistrustful of this idea of quarantine. They didn't believe in it. They didn't believe in the contagiousness of the disease. So they would hide their, their people, their family members. So it was always a struggle, trying to quarantine the lepers. The Hawaiians didn't want to be quarantined. They didn't trust uh, all these Euro European forces that were, were trying to do this. Well, it was actually during the reign of King Kamehameha V that the spot was chosen where all the lepers would be quarantined. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, actually. I'm a little bit behind here. Um, as you all know, leprosy is, is a bacterial uh, uh, bacteria. It, it affects, there's, I, I'm not entirely versed in the whole thing. We've got a couple of doctors here that could do a much better presentation than I could. But it's a bacteria, and I know it affects very much the nerves. Uh, it attacks the nerve endings, which the first symptom is numbness in the hands and feet and the, in the extremities. And there's actually two different forms, and one of the forms has this uh, characteristic um, kind of boils or, or cysts that, that grow on the, uh, that form. If you go to the next uh, slide, this is another form of it where it seems, please correct me if I'm wrong, that the body actually starts to absorb the nose and the fingers start to retract into to the hands and whatnot. And it's said that it gives the person a lion-like appearance. Leonine, their face starts to look like a line. This, this lady here, obviously, you can see where that comes from. The, the face kind of retracts. The, the nose is getting swallowed up there into it. Um, if you go to the next slide. So this right here, obviously, is Molokai. This was the spot. This peninsula was the spot chosen by the Hawaiian monarchy to quarantine the lepers. And it's, it's an ideal spot because you have these huge cliffs which surround Molokai, at this point they're 2,000 feet high. A little bit further on, they're actually 4,000 feet high. It's the largest sea cliffs, highest sea cliffs in the world. But if you look right here, you see a volcanic crater. The way this peninsula was formed, this peninsula is not as old as the main island is. The island formed, and then this volcano became active and created a landmass that connected it to the bigger landmass. So it's just a, a plot of land that's out there, and there are 2,000-foot cliffs separating it from the rest of Molokai. And Molokai always has been one of the uh, islands that has not been very highly uh, populated. Uh, when the leper colony was established there, it seems there were only 2,000 people living on the whole island. So if you go to the next one, these are just a different view of the cliffs. Go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. This right here is interesting. This is the path that goes up the poly. As you can see, it's very, very arduous, very, very difficult. That was the only way to get out of the leper colony uh, at the time to get onto the, the top. Go to the next slide, please. Okay, this right here is just a picture uh, I took from an, an airplane showing the, the area of the cliffs that are 4,000 feet, just because it's, it's very, very impressive. So we go to the next slide. And we're going to leave it here for a while. So the government decided to sequester, to quarantine the lepers on this, this peninsula of land. And um, they started taking uh, the lepers there. And like I said, there was a lot of resistance. When St. Damien first went to Molokai, there were about 700 lepers there. At the height of his uh, work there, there were never more than about 1,200 to 1,500 lepers in the colony. 
So how did St. Damien end up there? In the midst of his, um, of, of all of this, this that was taking place, uh, the lepers in Molokai, 200 of them were Catholics, around 200. And they started begging the bishop for a priest because the conditions in Molokai when they went there were terrible. They didn't even have beds in the hospital. They had mats laid out. Uh, I spoke a little bit about the physical problems of leprosy. The spiritual situation in Molokai was even worse than the physical problems. The people felt totally abandoned. They were without their, their, parent, uh, their family members. They were extremely given to despair. And they, their only outlet was through sinfulness. So they gave themselves into all the types of sinfulness you can imagine. Uh, they would make a very strong alcoholic beverage, and they would all get drunk, and then they would revert into to all types of orgies, all types of horrible things uh, along that nature. Uh, they had no care for their fellow men. Uh, one of the bishops that preceded St. Damien to minister to the Catholics uh, was inside a house looking out a window, and he saw a man with a wheelbarrow go into a hut, pick one of the lepers up off the floor, and wheel him out into the middle of the field and just dump him off and then go in and, and take control of his house. I mean, that's the kind of thing that was taking place. The bodies, when they were buried, were buried in very shallow graves or just thrown out in the field. And at night, the pigs would come and root up the bodies and, and eat them. It was a horrible situation, horrible situation. So you can imagine these Catholics that were there, they were wanting some spiritual consolation. Uh, it was very rare, maybe two or three times a year, a priest would visit them. They wanted a constant priestly presence there. So they started to ask the bishop to send a priest. So the bishop wanted very much to, to cater to the needs of these Catholics and, and to support these lepers that were in such a terrible situation. So he took advantage of a ceremony he was having in Maui. Uh, there were a group of, of Sacred Hearts Fathers that were converging on Maui because a new church had been built. And the bishop was coming to uh, consecrate that church. And there were four priests who were there, four Sacred Heart priests. And after the celebration, after the ceremony, the bishop took these four priests aside and he said, Look, the Catholics, the lepers in Molokai, want a constant priest there. And all four priests uh, volunteered to go. He didn't command anyone. All four agreed to, to go to Molokai. So what they decided to do was they would do a rotation. Each priest would take three months out of the year and stay with the lepers in Molokai. St. Damien was the first one who was chosen to go. He was the first installment, um, the first priest that was going to go. So. This was something that was happening directly. St. Damien didn't even bring a suitcase with him when he went to Maui. And he was told, if you're going to go do this, you're going to go directly to the leper colony now. He didn't have a chance even to go back and pick up his belongings from the big island. So he was dropped off in Molokai, and he started to cater to the lepers. Um, it's very, very interesting. When this took place, there was an enormous hullabaloo in all the newspapers. People were out just blown away by the fact that a priest would give himself his whole life to the care of the lepers. It was something unheard of. And because of this, St. Damien started to get a lot of good publicity in the press. Just a little side note, it's very interesting to note that this notion of a group of, of Catholic priests or nuns giving their lives to the lepers is not something that's unique in history. In fact, when leprosy started spreading to Europe, it was very common for them to establish leper colonies. They called them Lazar houses, named after Lazarus from the, uh, from the Bible, the, the parable of our Lord. So by the year 1000, there were 2000 Lazar houses spread throughout Europe, taking care of lepers, housed by religious. The religious cared for them. They, uh, they would even, it was, it was very common for them to kiss the wounds of the lepers because in their zeal, they saw in the leper the person of our Lord Jesus Christ.
So why was this such a big deal? What happened? I think, and this is just purely my speculation, I think it shows how far society had slid from the, the heights of Christian civilization. That was a commonplace occurrence. That a, a priest or a nun would give their lives to care for the lepers and, and basically agreed to die with them was a common occurrence when Christian civilization was in its full, uh, its highest point. So you can say what St. Damien did was basically took something, he took that zeal of the Middle Ages of, of the Catholics of Christian civilization and he brought it to the modern world. And that's what shocked people so much. That was what was so shocking. He was kind of a remnant of that missionary self-sacrifice spirit that was not so uncommon in, uh, in the church in the past. Anyway, that's just a, uh, a speculation of mine. Take it for what it's worth. Um, so, when St. Damien arrived there, the first thing he did was he started to address his congregation as we lepers, even before he contracted the disease. There's a whole other uh, thing. St. Damien actually had had contact with a lot of lepers on the Big Island already. And there are some historians that think he already was infected with leprosy before he went to the, the leper colony. It's not certain. He certainly didn't know he had leprosy if he did. But it is possible that he was already infected with uh, leprosy. So St. Damien saw the terrible situation of the lepers there. And his first inclination was to act like the other doctors and the other missionaries had. Uh, the other doctors would never approach the uh, lepers too closely. If they had to examine them, they would use a stick to, to move clothing aside or whatever. They wouldn't uh, come close to them. They wouldn't live together with them. And as you all know, the Hawaiian people are very given to physical contact. They, they want to hug each other. They want to be very close. They want to share food with each other. Well, when St. Damien went there, he wasn't at all uh, thinking about putting himself in that kind of danger, but very shortly he saw these people were despairing and he saw that they needed that type of ministry. So there was a point in which he changed. He stopped this notion of keeping himself separate from the lepers and he decided to throw caution to the wind and to actually minister to them, to have physical contact with them. And it's not sure when that decision was made by St. Damien. There's a story, this actually did take place. It's not certain if this was the moment or not, but there's a very beautiful story uh, about this. And St. Damien um, was in his, his church one day, and a little boy who was a leper came into the church. And he said, Father Damien, when I, before I contracted leprosy, I used to be an altar boy. And he said, I would love to continue that here. He said, I'd love to serve your masses. He said, but don't worry. He said, I'll, I'll never touch you. I won't touch you. And St. Damien looked at him and he said, okay. He said, I think we can make a deal. He said, but we're men. And when men make a deal, they have to shake hands on it. So he put his hand out and he shook the hand uh, of the young boy. So certainly by that time, he was totally convinced that he was going to throw caution to the wind. And after that, he literally threw caution to the wind. Eyewitnesses saw him eating with lepers and they would have a communal bowl of sauce and they'd be dipping their bloody fingers in the sauce, and St. Damien would eat, I thought of it afterwards. He'd share his pipe with the, the, whole, the lepers. He took no precaution at all. Now, this was something that was very difficult for St. Damien to do. He had a nausea of, of the lepers when he first went there. I don't want to turn this into a, a gory uh, story, but just a couple of things that he witnessed will give you an idea of the the physical repulsion he had in dealing with the lepers. Um, he was in the confessional one day, and he, the man that was confessing to him, he looked over and his ribs were exposed, and there were worms eating his flesh. That's how bad it was. Uh, there was a lady he saw who was laying on the ground. She wasn't even in a bed, and her intestines were all showing, her ribs were showing, and there were thousands, swarms of thousands of, of worms eating there. He uh, came across a man one day in his house, and the man was busy doing something. St. Damien looked in, he had a glass shard, and the man was cutting his finger off because it was hanging and it was a nuisance to him. And he cut it off and he threw it out the window and he said, finally, I'm, I'm finished with that. So St. Damien 
talks about being so horrified, he had to run out of the house several times just to get fresh air because he was becoming sick. Uh, St. Damien had always been a pipe smoker, but he started smoking his pipe all the time. And he said he did that because the stench of the lepers was getting on his clothing and he was trying to cover up the smell with the smoke because it was so hard for him to, to handle, handle that stench. So before St. Damien reached that point, he had a real battle to overcome. He had to up, overcome his own physical revulsion. As you can imagine, anyone put in that situation would have. So St. Damien, uh, like I mentioned, uh, started to give the Hawaiian people hope. Everyone was in despair. He needed to have enough hope to with, uh, endure the situation himself and have enough hope for all the lepers as well. And one of the first things he did, and one thing that he did continually during his whole time in Molokai, was he started building coffins and digging graves, giving the lepers a proper burial. And um, during uh, St. Damien's time there, where is this? Is it? 2,000 people died. It was there for 16 years, 2,000 people died, which turns out to a burial every one, uh, one to two days, or two to three days, I think it was. I figured it out. Yeah, every two to three days. So this was a constant occupation from him. He was always building coffins, burying the dead, burying the dead, giving them a proper burial. Uh, he also gave them hope, like I mentioned. One of the first things he did was form a choir and a band. And he gave them a tremendous amount of hope. Uh, during one of their uh, performances, one of the musicians actually lost a finger. And he continued playing because of that hope that St. Damien had, had given him. Um, similarly, an organist in the church lost the fingers on his left hand. So he couldn't hit the bass notes anymore. So he actually got a stick and tied it to his arm so he could eat, at least hit one bass note when he was playing the church music. That was the kind of spirit that St. Damien gave to them. That was the hope he gave them. Uh, another thing, he occupied himself in tremendously. And this is a little bit of a different picture uh, of a saint than you normally get, but he was a lion fighting against the immorality of the people. I mentioned the uh, drunken parties that the Hawaiian lepers would have. Whenever they did that, they would pay, play a very um, easily recognizable drum beat. That was kind of what, what got them into start dancing and all of these things. And St. Damien got a big cane, and he would walk around at night just listening for that drum beat. And if he heard it, he would follow it, break into the house, and beat the lepers until they left. Just cast them out, just to stop that immorality. So another thing St. Damien did, uh, we mentioned that he was very uh, active ministering to the lepers. But there were many Catholics that were at the top of the poly also. So he would climb the poly very frequently and minister to those Catholics as well. So we see a tremendous workload. He actually built one or two churches on the top of the poly. One of them still exists today. You can, you can visit that church that he did. So it was a continual, continual work. But in September of 1873, a terrible thing happened for St. Damien. St. Damien had a very sensitive conscience. He uh, felt the need to confess a lot. Confession was one of his greatest supports he had in life. Well, in 1873, the Board of Health uh, took away St. Damien's permission to travel to and from the leper colony. So he was abandoned in the leper colony. And it was illegal for anyone to come visit him or for him to leave to receive confession. It was a terrible, terrible suffering for him. And in fact, it lasted for several months he was in this situation. And there's a very beautiful story that many of you I'm sure have heard, which was at a certain point he had heard that there was a priest coming on a boat that was dropping off lepers in Molokai. So he went to the shore and tried to get the priest to land on the shore. And the captain of the boat would not allow the priest to land because he was given strict orders no one was to set foot on Molokai. So St. Damien rode out in a boat and sat in a boat underneath this big ship and screamed his confession in front of everyone to this priest who was on board. He confessed in French, which many people didn't understand, but there were plenty of people that understood it. It was a public confession, just so he could receive 
uh, the sacrament of confession. The captain of that boat was not a Catholic at the time. He was so impressed with what St. Damien had done, he ended up converting. So this whole situation of St. Damien not being able to leave came to a head when a brother from his community, a fellow priest from his community, was visiting Catholics on the top of the poly, and in the middle of the night he snuck down into the leper colony to hear St. Damien's confession. And the government found out about it, and they arrested the priest for doing that because it was breaking the law. That created such a public outcry. People were so upset that St. Damien, who was a hero in their eyes, had been uh, prevented from even getting uh, spiritual help when he was there, that the government gave him a very special permission and um, allowed him to, to travel freely to and from the leper colony. So that was a trial that only lasted a, a few months for him. Well, in 1877, when, when St. Damien first went there, he started asking for building materials because unfortunately a huge number of the lepers were orphans. Uh, a lot of them, children for some reason, are more susceptible to the, to the disease of leprosy, to catch it. So you had a lot of children taken away from their families, and you also had a lot of children whose parents had died. So one of the first things St. Damien wanted to do was build an orphanage. So finally he was granted the uh, building materials in 1877, and he built two orphanages, one for the boys and one for the girls. He took it upon himself to care for the boy lepers, but it was already at that point, 1877, he started asking for a group of sisters to come to the leper colony uh, in order to take care of the girl orphans. That eventually led to Sister uh, St. Mary and Cope coming uh, with, I think it was seven other sisters, Sacred Heart sisters, to take care of the, uh, the girls orphanage. Well, in 1881, uh, another very important thing took place. Princess Lilio Kalani and Queen Kapiolani came to visit the leper settlement. And St. Damien had them greeted with full honors. He had the whole band come and, and meet them and play music for them and whatnot. And the situ situation was so touching. Uh, Princess Lilio Kalani had a whole speech that she was set to give. And she wasn't able to give that because she was choking back tears. She couldn't even speak. And Queen Kapiolani was extremely impressed with St. Damien's work there. And when she returned to Oahu, she established, because of the inspiration she received, seeing how St. Damien cared for the lepers, she founded Kapiolani Medical Center, which was to be a hospital for women, which of course is one of the largest hospitals uh, in, on Oahu even to this very day. So that was founded under the inspiration of, of St. Damien's work. It was when they returned also that they uh, decided to award St. Damien the Order of Knight Commander of the Royal Order of Kalakaua in recognition of his, quote, efforts in alleviating the distresses and mitigating the sorrows of the unfortunate. It's very, very uh, interesting. That was the only military honor that the government of Hawaii had and they awarded it to St. Damien. It's kind of a funny story, because as you, many of you know, King Kalakaua, one of the things he's famous for, known for, is he circumnavigated the globe twice as king. He went on world tours. And on his first tour, he went to Japan first, I think. He went to two or three Asian countries, and everyone was bestowing military awards on him. And he looked at his counselor and he said, we don't have any military awards to bestow on people. So he invented this award that was awarded to St. Damien and others just so that the Hawaiian government would have a military award to bestow on people as well. And St. Damien was one of the recipients of that award. Uh, you'll see later, you can see that award pinned to his burial hall when he, was, uh, when, he was, when he died. So one of the things that St. Damien really, really suffered with was the lack of a companion. I mean, you imagine everybody, all of your closest friends have a terminal disease. They're all dying around you. You're burying two to, uh, one every two to three days the whole time you're there. He wanted a companion. And above all, he wanted a priest so that he would be able to confess when he wanted to. So you can go to the next uh, slide, please. At a certain point, uh, finally, Father Andre Bergerman, this gentleman right here, was sent to be St. Damien's companion. And 
if you all are familiar with the geography of the, the uh, peninsula on Molokai, there is Kalavao is on the far side, and Kalapapa is on the, the near side. When St. Damien went there, Kalavao was the only place that had a church. By this time, there were two churches. So Father uh, Brugman was sent to the one on the other side in Kalapapa. And the worst possible companion you can imagine having, Father Brugman was worse than all that. He didn't want to be uh, a Sacred Heart Father anymore. He was trying to leave the order. He didn't even want to be a priest anymore. He wanted to be a doctor. And worse yet, he had an explosive temperament. Explosive. He fought with, with Father Damien continually. He was always complaining about the order. He wanted to get back. Things reached uh, ahead. Things got so bad that at a certain point, uh, Father Brugman threatened to, to shoot St. Damien. He said, I'm going to blow your brains out. He ran into the back room to, uh, <laughs> to get his gun. St. Damien had to flee for his life, literally. So the first companion he had was absolutely despicable. It was a disaster. So St. Damien started asking that he be taken out of the leper, leper supplement. It took a long time. Finally, he was removed. So the first companion that St. Damien had was a disaster. In fact, he spent half of the time, eight of the 16 years he spent in Molokai, he spent without a companion. But later on, they spent, sent another companion for St. Damien, who was Father Monaton, this gentleman right here. And Father Monaton, the only reason he wasn't worse than Father Brugman is he never tried to kill St. Damien. It was very, very difficult to get along with. Very, very difficult. He went to the leper colony, and he was convinced that St. Damien was violating his vow of chastity. There was no logic to it. He had heard rumors and he was convinced. When he arrived, the first three days straight, he lectured Father Damien about how important the vow of chastity was and how you didn't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't break it. For the first three days straight, several months later, they switched churches because Father Monaton was always complaining. He knew St. Damien was a carpenter, so he was always complaining, come fix my door, come fix this. And the door to the tabernacle was broken. So he had St. Damien come to work on that. As soon as he got in Calabao, where St. Damien was, he fired St. Damien's cook, because it was a woman, and two other women that used to assist his work. Because for some reason he was convinced. Now during the same time, Father Monaton was very into choir music. He loved choir. And he used to hold choir practice with women inside his bedroom. So he wasn't taking any precautions for himself, and he took it upon himself to fire uh, St. Damien's helpers who were women. It was, it was something that was just unbearable. Just to give you an idea, though, St. Damien was so desperate for a companion that Father Monaton wasn't happy there. He started asking to leave, and St. Damien was begging for him to stay. Begging for him to stay. And he wouldn't. He ended up uh, leaving as well. So, Father Damien, St. Damien continued to work, continued to do his work at the leper colony, and in 1884, something very significant happened. He was in Honolulu, and he went to soak his feet, and the pot of water that he soaked it in, he hadn't put any, any cold water in it, it was just boiling water, and he put his feet in, and he saw them start to blister, and he didn't feel anything which was one of the, the surest signs that he had contracted leprosy. So he went to his, uh, his doctor, he was examined, and he was diagnosed certainly uh, as having leprosy. And when this happened, news of Father Damien having contracted the disease spread everywhere. It's very beautiful, though, because St. Damien accepted it very willingly, very willingly. And he wrote to his brother, saying, don't feel bad for me. He said, because the first day I came to Molokai to minister to the lepers, I knew I had a chance of contracting the disease, and it's something back then that I already willingly accepted. So I've already accepted this, don't worry about it. Uh, in the ceremony, when a Sacred Heart Father uh, is uh, finally inducted into the order of the Sacred Hearts, not even as a priest, but as a lay brother, part of the ceremony you have to lay down under a burial pall. 
which is symbolic of you dying to the world so you live only for Christ. And he said, throughout my whole experience in Molokai, I remember that moment. And I remember that I'm already a dead man for my own wishes. So he took it with all naturality, all naturality. But when this took place, when news that Father Damien had contracted leprosy spread, everybody in the world, people in Europe became enthusiastic about St. Damien. They, they couldn't believe it. And even people of other faiths were extremely impressed by this. One Anglican minister in England, a gentleman by the name of Hugh Chapman, started a fund to raise money for St. Damien and his works there. And almost immediately after he, he founded this organization, which actually was supported by Cardinal Manning, it had the support of a lot of very high-ranking prelates in the church, he sent a thousand pounds to the leper colony, which was a very substantial chunk of money back then. So you would imagine that people in Hawaii would be very happy that they're receiving donations from overseas to help the lepers out. Problem is, with all this publicity, three people, three entities, I should say, became extremely jealous and they became furious when money started to pour into the leper colony. One was the government of Hawaii. Another one was St. Damien's bishop, Bishop Copeman, and another one was his uh, provincial superior, the superior of the Sacred Heart Fathers in Hawaii, Father Fusnel, because they said that this makes us look bad. It makes us look like we can't care for the lepers ourselves. We need to go to outside to have, have money come in. The government wasn't as much of a problem. When this took place, these two men started a vicious, vicious uh, persecution of St. Damien. Uh, they began to alienate all the other members of the order against him. They started sending letters to the mother house in, in France saying, don't celebrate this Damien of Molokai. He's an egotistical maniac. Don't have anything to do with him. They accused him of being impossible to deal with. They said, we've already sent him two companions, and he couldn't deal with either one of them. He had arguments with, with both of them. Do you remember the two companions he had? And it's actually funny because about that time when Father Fusnel sent that letter back to the mother time in Paris, Father Brugman became angry and had gotten into an argument with him about coffee, and he punched him and split his lip open. So all of this was taking place, and he's sending back, all oh, this Damien is, is just impossible to get along with. He can't even get along with Father Brugman and Father Bonneton. So there was a tremendous... Uh, pressure on St. Damien, and this caused St. Damien more suffering than anything else. He, uh, in a letter to his brother, he claimed, he said, I no longer have any friends in the order at all. And um, it, it was very, very difficult. He also said that the persecution he received from these two superiors was so great, so terrible, he said, that suffering was worse than the suffering of my leprosy. So it's, le dealing with leprosy was easy compared to this. The worst thing was they started to deny St. Damien access to confession. They wouldn't let him confess anymore. At a certain point, St. Damien was dying to go to confession. He wrote his superior asking permission to go to Honolulu to go to confession and to go to the hospital to get his own leprosy treated and to bring the newest treatments back to the leper colony, and he was openly forbidden. St. Damien threatened to go in spite of the fact that he was forbidden, and he gave him permission to go. This was the, the atmosphere at that time. It was, it was something very, very terrible. So St. Damien didn't know what to do in face of all this. And at this time, there was another priest, very, very interesting priest, Father Louis Lambert Conrardi. He was a very adventure-seeking priest. He had actually spent time as a missionary to the Indians in Oregon, very, very active. He started writing St. Damien saying that he wanted to come and live with him at the leper settlement. He said, I'm very touched by your work. I want to join in your work there. So Father Conrardi got all of the permissions necessary. He, he got everything taken care of. And when he asked Bishop Copeman and Father Fusnel if he could go to the leper colony, they said no. 
They said, because we don't want any priests that are outside the Sacred Arts Order coming in. We don't need any stranger priests. They said, if you want to go and work with the lepers, that's fine. Go join the novitiate in France of the Sacred Hearts Fathers, and you can come to the leper colony. Of course, by the time he completed the novitiate, St. Damien would have been long dead, and there wouldn't have been any, any help to him at all. To make a long story short, uh, Father Conrardi was not only adventuresome, but he was a bit of a politician. And I'm not going to go into all the details, but he ended up putting political pressure on the bishop. And finally, the bishop allowed him to come in. And finally, in the last, this would have been the last two or three years of uh, St. Damien's life, he had a companion, which was Father Conrardi. But it was incredible. You see the continual persecution of St. Damien. And that's a mark that you see a lot in the lives of the saints. Many, many of them receive persecution from their superiors. It's something that, that is not that unordinary. It's something that if you really want to follow our Lord Jesus Christ and carry his cross, you have to be prepared to bear that. So finally, in November 1888, this is just a question of a few months before St. Damien died, um, the bishop allowed St. Marion Cope, and together with... Um, a contingent of sisters, I think it was six or seven sisters, to come and start ministering to the orphan girls in the, uh, the settlement. Now, St. Damien, as I mentioned, was continually asking for a companion, and he was continually refused, refused, refused. One of the greatest slaps he received from his superiors was the fact that when St. Marion was sent, she was sent with two priests to live with her. And the reason for that was given, because the bishop said, it would, Father Damien's going to die soon, and it would be inhuman to expect nuns to live in such conditions without having a priest to confess to. What was the reason for the second priest? Because St. Damien was about to die, and it would be inhuman to expect a priest to live in that situation without having another priest to confess to. So right before St. Damien's death, after denying him and denying him and denying him, they sent two priests to come with the sisters. It was something absolutely terrible that, that he endured. And you can imagine the, the suffering St. Damien endured because of all of this. Uh, very, very, very difficult uh, for him to deal with. So throughout 1889, in the beginning of uh, 1888, the beginning of 1889, St. Damien's condition continues to worsen. Um, as in all things, he, he acted like a bull. He kept fighting, he kept working. Um, if you go to the next slide, this of course is St. Philip Philomena's church, which is in, is in Calavao. This church was already there when St. Damien arrived at the leper colony, but you'll notice there's a section added on here. This was the original church, this is the section added on. This was added on by St. Damien, because when he was in the advanced stages of leprosy, <coughs> Uh, he received a gift that he had been asking for a long time of a beautiful tabernacle to put in the church. So the tabernacle was too big for the small chapel they had, so he enlarged the church in his last months of life to fit the tabernacle. If you go to the next slide, this is the inside. That's the high altar that was there that he enlarged the church in order to house it. Up until the time when St. Damien was not able uh, to stand anymore. Right up to the day, the last day he was able to stay out of bed, he was on the roof of St. Philomena Church, putting the roof on. He continued to work, he continued to, to minister. Um, we go to the next slide. This obviously is uh, a picture of St. Damien, already in the advanced stages of leprosy. This was a few weeks before he died, and he's with the boys uh, of his orphanage, uh, ministering to them. You can see his ear is hugely enlarged already. Now if you go to the next slide, this was taken at that same time. Um, you all know this picture very, very well. I'm not going to dwell on it too long, but you see the, the ear again. And I notice his hands. I mean, you can see the power he had in those hands. Those were hands that worked, that did things. They built, they, they ministered to people. His right arm is in a sling because he had lost the use of it already at this point. But he was in this condition when he was still putting the roof on St. Uh, Philomena's. Well, on March 31st, um, Easter was drawing near, and St. Damien was quoted as having said, I've seen too many lepers die to be deceived. 
He said, I know our Lord is calling me to celebrate Easter with him. So um, he said that 13 days before he died, 13 years, uh, days later, he died. If you go to the next slide, this is a series of pictures taken at St. Damien's death. This was the day he died or the day before he died. It was right at the end. St. Damien was so weak in these pictures, he couldn't support himself. They were trying to get him to prop himself up so they could take a, a picture of him before he died. If you go to the next slide, what they had to do is they'd prop him up on pillows and get out of the way, and the photographer would take a quick shot before he fell over. It took three or four shots before they could get this one. Uh, you'll notice, it's curious, uh, it's very common in leprosy patients, right before they die, a lot of their, their wounds subside. You can see he doesn't look nearly as bad as he did, but again, his hands, these are monster hands, and you can see the effects of the disease very much on his hands. Um, if you go to the next slide, this is uh, St. Damien with St. Marion. She had arrived, she was at his funeral. Oops. If you look right here, you'll notice the military insignia. That's the award, the military award St. Damien received that I had mentioned uh, earlier. Um, St. Damien had always said that he wanted to be buried under the, the tree that he spent his first night in Molokai sleeping under. Because when St. Damien went there, he didn't, even have a, uh, he didn't even have a home. And at that time, he was too frightened to spend a night in a house that was housed by lepers, so he slept under a tree. And so it was his wishes that he would be buried under that same tree that he spent his first night in uh, Molokai underneath. So that's where he was buried. If you go to the next uh, slide. I'm not sure if this is the place of his original tomb, because shortly after his death, uh, the Belgians asked for his body back, as you all know. The body was given back. It's actually in the, the Sacred Hearts Convent Monastery in Louvain, and they sent an arm back. Uh, St. Damien's arm is buried here, and obviously you have the big relic of St. Damien in the cathedral there. And it's something that I always have marveled at, because the Hawaiians have a tremendous um, <clears throat> devotion to St. Damien. And I think it's very, very proper, because Hawaii is a place where one of the defects, and again, I'm, I'm not trying to point fingers here, but we all know that one of the defects of life in Hawaii is people think of this as a paradise. It's probably more tourists than it is the people here, but this is a place where people go to enjoy the sins of the flesh. Everything is the body, it's health, it's all these things. And yet you see the persistent devotion of the Hawaiians to a man that allowed his flesh to be rotted away for love of souls. They pay respects to him because he did something much greater than, than anyone who, who gives in to, to all these, these things of the, the health and whatnot. Well, the cause of Father Damien was not officially started up and actively introduced until 1955. St. Damien died in 1889. Why do you suppose it took so long for them to start studying his cause? Seriously. Suppression. What's that? Suppression. Yes, it was a continuation of the persecution he suffered. The Vatican received requests to have the, the cause started immediately. They sent a commission from Rome to study his life, and the bishop and Father Fusnel got together, and they said, look, he was not a saint. He wasn't a good person. He was full of pride. He was hard to get along with. They only allowed the, the Vatican Commission to interview two people, St. Damien's doctor and the, um, the head, the government head of the leper colony in Molokai. They were not allowed to interview a single Hawaiian, a single person who St. Damien ministered to. Of course, by 1955, all of those lepers had died off, so we don't have any first-hand reports of the lepers, what they said about how Father Damien cared for them, what he did. <clears throat> the persecution went that far. <coughs> um, obviously, St. Damien was uh, beatified in 1992, and he was canonized in 2009 uh, when the second miracle. Little, just another uh, little tidbit uh, about historically the effect that St. Damien had on Hawaii. Uh, when 
Hawaii was officially accepted as a state. Whenever a new state comes into being, they're allowed to put two statues in the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. that represent the history of their state, what the best their state has to offer. The government, uh, the state government of Hawaii decided that the two statues they wanted, one of which would be a representation of King Kamehameha the Great, the one who united all the islands under a single rule, the other statue they put in the Capitol building was one of St. Damien. And it's an exact replica of the statue which is in front of the Capitol building here in, in Honolulu today. So <clears throat> that's pretty much what I had to say about St. Damien's life. If I could just close with a, a couple of thoughts, I just want to reiterate this notion that St. Damien was great because he accepted suffering. Again, we know it's very hard to accept suffering. The modern world doesn't want us to accept suffering. He wants us to forget about suffering. St. Damien great, gained greatness because he embraced the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The other point that I want to make again is we're in a situation where many times doing the right thing is not going to get praise from people. We're going to get persecuted for defending what we should. We're going to suffer these persecutions. But remember, St. Damien suffered through all of those persecutions, and in the end, he ended up being glorified anyway. They tried to suppress him as much as possible, and it didn't work. If we're true to what we should do, first and foremost, we'll gain more glory to God. And second of all, providence has its way of making the lives of those who really give themselves to him shine forth when he wants it. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, Rick. Specifically wanted to be married here. I know that was. Yes, I, I. I know that's a very sensitive subject here in Hawaii, and, and, and rightfully so. Rightfully so. He belongs. He belongs in Kalapa. Absolutely, absolutely. One of the things that I, I didn't even say a word about, Brother Dutton. I'm sorry. He was also a very sacrificial soul who lived with St. Damien uh, for the last few years of his life. He never became a priest. Uh, but Father Dutton, uh, Brother Dutton, he was not a priest, fortunately lived to the extremes of old age. And in 1955, when the process was officially open, Brother Dutton was still alive. So certain eyewitness accounts of how Father Damien lived with the lepers and whatnot did come out through the testimony of, of Brother Dutton. I just want to put that as, as an aside. Yes, please, sir. Protestant ministers persecuted him, they were Protestants who defended him, too. There were many Protestant ministers that persecuted him, and there were Protestant ministers that de defended him. The, the best known, I'm forgetting his name right now, but he wrote a private letter trashing on St. Damien and saying that he was uh, had a harem of leper women, that, that all of these things, saying he was egotistical and whatnot. He wrote a private letter to someone else saying these things, and that person published it. It went in the newspapers all over the world. And Robert Louis Stevenson, who was suffering from tuberculosis at the time, was here on the Hawaiian Islands. He ended up dying in Samoa, Robert Louis Stevenson. He, of course, is the one that wrote Treasure Island, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, a famous author. He was not a, a Catholic. And he was not really even a Christian, Robert Louis Stevenson. He visited the leper colony a few months after St. Damien died. And after he left the leper colony, he read this notice in the paper of this letter that the Protestant minister here in Oahu had written. And was so furious, he locked himself in his room and said, I will not leave this room until I have written a rebuttal to what this man said. And it's about a 23-page rebuttal that Robert Louis Stevenson wrote in defense of St. Damien. It's very, very well written. Very emotional, but very, very well, well written. So St. Damien did receive uh, persecution from not only his own superiors, but from Protestants as well. And actually, uh, the Protestants' missionaries, in fact, were very upset about St. Damien because of all the publicity he was gaining for the church. Uh, just to give you an idea, the Sacred Hearts con uh, Congregation doubled in size the year after St. Damien's death. Many people say that the cradle of the Sacred Hearts Father was the tomb of St. Damien because his publicity spread the, the order. The Protestants were very, very uh, upset about...
thought all the publicity the church was getting. And in fact, they called a huge council of, of all the different denominations. And they said, look, we're receiving a bad rap because none of us have gone there and died with the lepers. They said, the only way we can combat this and save face is if one of us volunteers to go and do what St. Damien did. Go there and die with him. Not a single person volunteered. Nobody was willing to go and, and do what he did. Does anybody have any other questions? I know it's been a long talk. It's hot. Everyone's tired. Everyone's hungry. Ready to eat. Any other questions? Comments? Yes, Adolfo. They did make a movie. They did make a movie. Yes. They did make a movie about St. Damien. I've seen it, actually. Yes. Have been traced the origin of this disease uh, for sure? For that provision where it came from? And they haven't. Came? Are you saying St. Damien personally or how leprosy came no, no, here? How leprosy got to the island, really. It but seems it, most likely it came from China, from what I've read. I'm, I'm not an expert or anything. But there were a lot of Chinese coming over, and the disease was prevalent in parts of China at the time. Uh, there were a lot of Chinese workers immigrating here. Did uh, we have the disease in North America or Europe at the time? I don't know. I'm, I've never heard of North America. I know South America had a lot of cases of leprosy. I don't know, Dr. Moffat, you probably would know better than I would. Okay. Yes. Undoubtedly some from North America, too, probably. Oh, okay. Wow. So there were lepers in North America. They had a hospital in Louisiana. Okay, well, if, if that's it, maybe we can uh, pray the prayers before meals, and please enjoy uh, the wonderful spread of food we have here. Um, if we can limit ourselves to as few of tables as possible, that will be great. I don't think we'll fit on two tables, but let's say at the maximum of three, because uh, we have to clean the tables before we leave, so if we can keep the mess down to uh, a minimum. We'll go ahead and pray uh, to finish. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Bless us, O Lord, in these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty, through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Thank you very much.